my pleasure to be able to introduce Dr. Katsumi Katsumi Nino. Not bad. <laughs> As you probably know, Dr. Nino was a pediatrician here in Janesville for many years. And I'm sure he would be able to tell us many stories about what it's like to be a medical professional. Um, and I'm sure it would be fascinating. But he's here tonight to talk about a different period in his life. Uh, when he was just a teenager, long before he made his way to Janesville to start his medical practice, he and his family were in a Japanese internment camp, along with over 100,000 Japanese Americans during World War II. And he's going to share a little bit about that experience. So would you welcome Dr. Nino. I'm here to talk about the incarceration, imprisonment of 130,000 Japanese based solely on the ethnicity. There was no trial, no judgment, and uh, two-thirds of, of us were American citizens by birth. But uh, on the 19th of February, 1942, shortly after Pearl Harbor, President uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt issued the Executive Order 9099 in which he stated he gave authority to any military commander to secure his area of command by either rejecting or retaining any individual. Now on the East Coast, where the German submarines were sinking Allied transports and ship, nothing happened. On the West Coast, it was a different matter. The Western Command that included Oregon, Washington, and California was commanded by uh, General John DeWitt. And to show you what kind of a person he was, by my definition, he was a jerk. <laughs> but to quote it directly, and I'm sure you'll agree with me, and he, these are direct quote by Dr. Uh, General DeWitt. Racial affiliations are not severed by migration. The Japanese race is not is an enemy race. And while many second generation Japanese born in United States soil possess a view of citizenship, have become Americanized, the racial stains are undiluted. It therefore follows that along the vital Pacific coast, over 120,000 potential enemies of Japanese extraction are at large today. Number two, a Jap's a Jap, and that's all there is to it. This is uh, kind of interesting. When I first came to James Hill, one of my, uh, and I joined the Pembroke News and Clinic, one of my fellow colleagues was using the term Jap, Jap, Jap. And I had to tell him that don't ever use that term, that same as using an N-word to a black person. Now, in all fairness to him, he didn't realize that. So he was very apologetic. Um, but General DeWitt knew exactly that it was an insult. So he says, a Jap's a Jap, and that's all there's to it. Then this last one, you needn't worry about the Italians or Germans, except in individual cases. But we must worry about the Japanese all the time until he's wiped off the map. And then this last one applies to all of you. The very fact that no sabotage has taken place to date is a disturbing and confirming indication that such action will be taken. You haven't robbed the bank? Well, there you are. You're guilty. You're going to. Uh, was this kind of a person commanding our area of residence, we had no chance, whatever. So he um, ordered the evacuation of all Japanese 
and this was in May of 1942. The uh, concentration camps were all over the United States, and the stars are the imprisonment camps. I was assigned to post and right on the border of California, Arizona, uh, just south of what is now Havasu City. And uh, there was a, bit, a business problem. Everyone knew when the government would come after us. So my dad owned the restaurant, and the buyers all waited to the last minute. And uh, at the last minute, it was a take it or leave it proposition. So the more you own, the more you lost. Unfortunate, my dad's restaurant wasn't that high class. Uh, <laughs> illustrate the point. We had this restaurant, and uh, we had a dog and a cat. They slept in the restaurant, and they would sleep in the empty booth until the patient, uh, customer came. But at any rate, um, the, uh, we were living there, and the uh, order came after uh, General DeWitt's remarks. And uh, they were prison camps in every sense of the word after this the, there were 10 all told, and our camp was the largest. It held 20,000 people. They split that into three camps. Camp one, 10,000 people. Camp two, 5,000. Camp three, 5,000. And uh, my family was assigned to camp one. And, uh, The day of uh, evacuation, the order came to be at a certain place, each community, and uh, we were allowed to take only a suitcase. Oh, heck, my daughter can't even go on a sleep in on a weekend with just a suitcase. <laughs> but this is all we can take for the duration. The remainder of our um, possessions were put into a Japanese American Methodist church, which the vandals burned down while we were gone. The uh, military police came with their rifle and bayonet ready and prodded us into the buses, and off we went to the camp. The uh, camp were made up of Barracks, and anyone in the army will recognize immediately this is exactly the same. And uh, 20 feet wide and uh, 120 feet long. They compartmentalized the barracks into 20 by 20 sections. And you had to have over five people in a family before the government would allow you more space. So in our family, it consisted of my parents, my sister, my brother. And uh, we got there, and there were um, mattress covers, pile of straw. We were told to stuff the straw into the mattress cover, and that'll be our mattress for the duration. The, um, The, the cabins were uh, hastily built, and the woods weren't cured, and so in due time they shrank. And uh, every time they had a dust storm, we were eating dust. What was even worse was there were a lot of scorpions and rattlesnakes, especially in the desert. The, um, we had a... Um, mess hall and uh, communal bathroom. For the men, 
we couldn't care less about having no privacy regarding showering, etc. But for the Japanese woman and the Japanese ladies normally are quite shy and private, it was quite traumatic. The food, I granted, the whole country was under rationing, but I do remember it was lousy. It was the first time I ever saw apple butter. Now, apple butter is not butter. They call it apple butter, but it uh, was exactly like applesauce that had become red with some dye or whatever. Well, our breakfast was apple butter with a hunk of bread. Lunch was apple butter with I don't know what. <laughs> Supper, it wasn't too bad in that we, uh, Japanese farmers grew a lot of vegetables, ran a dairy. Um, all the rest, I just, I think I blocked out completely. But I do remember one thing. One time, they were semi-full of squids that they delivered to the hall. This is not the uh, restaurant-quality calamari. <laughs> These were little squids, yay big, head there, eyeballs, and tentacles. They're about that big. And for about two weeks, that's all we had. And they fried it, and they boiled it, and they squashed it, but, you know, squid is squid. <laughs> and to this day, those eyes just haunt me. <laughs> well, the young men such as I were assigned to kitchen duty, so we washed the dishes, and... Um, you can imagine the number of silverware. Well, to try to <clears throat> dry the silverware by hand was just too much of a task. So we took a mattress cover. We would dump all the silverware in there, and about 10 of us would just shake it in <laughs> hot Arizona air and dry in no time. Well, obviously, you ladies shouldn't do this at home because <laughs> it, it would kind of scratch up the silverware. After a while, my sister was uh, working as a nurse's aide at the hospital. And um, the government realized they would have to feed patients whatever or, or diet ordered by the doctors. And the personnel at the hospital can uh, join in the, in the meals. So she said to my brother and myself, come on over here and work as an orderly and you'll get the good food. So at least for us, it wasn't too bad. Um, in May of 40, see, I had a, oh, around August, August of, of that year, the government realized they had to educate some of us. I had just finished my junior year in the hometown in California, and so I still needed a senior year. Well, there's no schools, so they just grabbed the empty ends of some barracks, and that was our classroom. Then they put out a call for teachers. Big problem. Back in California, the California Federation of Teachers would not accept any Orientals, so there were no teachers. So the government did the next best thing. They said, well, anybody with any kind of college education, will you do the best you can? Now, I still remember my English teacher was a Chinese major, Chinese history major, UCL Berkeley. And of course, everyone in college had English 101. So he taught as best he could. Our, um, my uh, solid geometry, trigonometry teacher was an engineer. Uh, he knew engineering, he knew his math, but he didn't know how to teach. And pedagogy, of course, is a science. If you didn't understand, well, let's try it this way, that kind of thing. 
all he can do with lecture. Our um, chemistry teacher was the nicest. He was a junior chem major from UCAL Berkeley. And uh, he would stand in front of the class, one of the barracks, take two paper cups and said, this is reagent A, this is reagent B, and I'm going to mix it. It's going to go boom, turn red, white, and blue, on purpose of being cynical. And uh, <laughs> he says, that's, that's the base reaction. But uh, we had no lab facilities. In fact, um, when I got to Madison from my pre-med, I didn't realize this thing here wasn't called a glass cup, it was a beaker. <laughs> and this thing that burned, that was a Bunsen burner, but I had to learn all that in the school. The, um, with the start of the war, President Roosevelt took away our citizenship, and um, he couldn't call us aliens. We weren't. We were American-born citizens. So he coined the term non-alien. So we lost our citizenship, but we weren't aliens. So we were non-aliens. And um, he closed all the universities for admission. And um, finished the high school and went to Chicago and got a job in the um, kitchen of Children's Memorial Hospital doing dishes. Um, my brother went to work in uh, St. Louis. My sister got a job as a nurse's aide at uh, Cook County Hospital. And then she went into nurses' training and became a nurse. The um, schools being close to us, I had no future at that time except to keep working as a kitchen worker. But the ACLU, American Civil Liberty Union, bless their hearts, uh, intervened and uh, was given the power by the president to assign Japanese Americans in small numbers, I guess small numbers so we don't start another Pearl Harbor, to various colleges. So I didn't choose Wisconsin. I was told, I was selected to go to Madison. The minute I on the road, I um, told the people in the office, uh, I need a room and board job tonight. I don't have any money for a room and board. The pay in the camps were terrible. If you were an unskilled worker such as I, it was $12 a month. If you were a skilled worker, like my mother, who was a professional seamstress, it was $16 a month. If you were highly trained, highly educated, like a doctor, you got paid $19 a month. So. I asked for a room, a board job. And can you imagine this day and age, this got the doctor's phone number. I called it and he answered the phone. <laughs> <laughs> Never happened now. <laughs> and um, so he said, well, come on over. And we talked for a while and didn't even call his wife took me home and told his wife, this is our new houseboy. And they treated me just wonderfully, just part of the family. I did scout work to be sure, but I was able to eat in the dining room with the family. They had a living maid. She served the family, including me, then had a retreat and eat in the kitchen by herself. So uh, the, uh, this is Dr. Arnold Jackson was his name, and they did treat me very well. The, um, there was no problem with the university. Uh, I, in fact, um, 
after I left camp and came into a Caucasian world, if you will, uh, no one ever hassled me. You know, even as an Oriental, I can't tell a Japanese from a Korean from a Chinese. And no one ever asked me which racial group I belonged to. If they had, then it would have been an entree for me to say, yes, I'm Japanese, I, I suffered all this. No one asked, no one cared. Oh, I, I shouldn't say no one cared. And all through my practice days, 42 years, um, I, I don't recall anyone ever asking me my race. And I think that just shows the goodness of the people of Wisconsin. The, um, going back to the camp life, we were uh, in these uh, barracks, and um, it's pretty monotonous working and going to school. But I do remember two things that was kind of funny. Um, what happened in getting the, making the camp, the U.S. Army wanted to get some land um, that belonged to the Colorado River Indian. That is a conglomeration of about five tribes, Navajos being most prominent. And they asked this group called the Colorado River Indians to sell them 20,000 acres to build the land. The Indians absolutely refused. They said, we will not participate in, in further discrimination to a minority group, bless their heart. Well, the army said, well, no problem. When we took the, all the land up to here, we'll just take 20,000 more acres and uh, build a camp. So that's where the camp was built. There's the irony there, too. In the camp, we had modern toilet facilities, electricity, all this. And the poor Indian tribes had none of that, no electricity. They had no school system. They had to send their kids to boarding schools for a whole week and they can come back only on the weekends. So ironically, we were better off being in prison than the poor native Indians. The uh, camp life was uh, pretty monotonous. The other thing was um, uh, two things. We started to play sports with the Indians on the reservation and both uh, baseball and um, basketball. Well, the Indian Reservation, of course, the Indians were pretty limited in numbers of athletes, but the 10,000 Japanese Americans, the majority came from high school and those that participated in the sports were varsity players. We cleaned our clock on everything we did. <laughs> The um, other thing that happened was um, there were two guys in camp that put the finger on the Japanese that uh, uh, were still had contact with the Japanese government. We called them Inu dogs for squealing on them. And uh, the... Um, some groups one night got after these two guys and beat their head down. The FBI or uh, the camp police arrested them, put them in the camp uh, police station. And the next day, the FBI was going to take them to Phoenix, trial and probable imprisonment. Well, all the campers, built bonfires, bonfires all around the camp prison. So there was no way the FBA could have accessed that place. And uh, then it got pretty wild. 
they decided I'd put up Japanese flags, sing Japanese war songs. Uh, we had a great time. <laughs> and uh, the FBI was going to have the Army go charging in. Fortunately, the uh, administrator of the camp had the common sense to say, no, well, let me take care of it. And what he did was simply left everything go, and after about a week, uh, let people out of the prison. But that uh, avoided a, quite a crisis. Um, the um, removal from the camp was allowed uh, in 1944, it was obvious that Japan lost the war. And um, we were allowed to leave, but we had to go through the usual FBI scrutiny and uh, answer a questionnaire, which I understand is a routine questionnaire given to everybody that joins the armed forces, for example. Uh, there are 30 questions in the Initial questions are simply the routine, your name, all this. But question 27 and 28 created considerable consternation for the campers. 27 asked, will you swear to serve loyally in, in the military? Well, no problem with that. But question 28 said, do you forswear allegiance to Emperor Japan? Well, not to be a grammarian, but to forswear would imply you had one time sworn allegiance and now you are forswearing it. And this may be nitpicking, but to many of the Japanese Americans, they, there's no way they can say yes, so they said no. So that automatically meant Question 27, we had served in the military, become a no. And we called them the no-no boys. And the FBI, I think there were about 5,000 of them, stuck them in prison. The um, camp life wasn't bad at all. You know. There wasn't much to do. But here I'm very grateful for being raised in a Japanese family. The Japanese family puts great value upon behaving well and education and uh, respect of authority. So there was really uh, no great problems in any of the assembly uh, camps except on this one occasion. The, um, we'd, I left camp in, um, it would be, well, I'll go back a bit. So in August, they had to start teachers, teach school. Put on a, put on a call for teachers, there weren't any. And back in California, the uh, Japanese couldn't become teachers because of the California Federation of Teachers. And they made do with whoever they could. But doggone it, it was still good enough for me to get into Madison, do well enough in pre-med and go on to med school. By the time I hit the med school, and I went to uh, Drexel University in Philadelphia, um, there was no discrimination prejudice. What was interesting, this is in Philadelphia, and I ran into a lot of Jewish kids. And they were so sympathetic, after all. We were put into prison, but when you take the whole history of the Jewish people, the diaspora of the Jewish people scattered all over against their will, uh, obviously ours is just a walk in the park, but they were so sympathetic, the nicest guys in the world. After I 
finished medical school, I came back to Madison for my internship. And uh, it was at the Methodist Hospital, which is on murder. And there's uh, nobody that's more cocky than a kid of our med school. He knows everything. <laughs> so the first day I meet, they had a nurse on this floor who obviously <laughs> knows better. And uh, we argue every day. <laughs> For example, the chief surgeon says he did a surgery on a guy and had clamps on. And he told me to take the clamps off. So I go on the floor and look for the head nurse, that's my wife, and said, Dr. Jackson said, take the clips off. So give me the clip remover. So she gives it to me. And I take it off and down to the last clip. And she says quietly, Dr. Jackson always takes off every other clip the last, first day. Well, thanks for telling me. <laughs> but I showed her. I left that last clip in the next day. The, um, the, the legal side to all this in the sense that um, some Japanese American attorneys got together and was looking for a candidate in, in prison in the camp to challenge the, this law of imprisonment. And the, they found the perfect person. This is a 21-year-old secretary from Sacramento, California. And um, she went through, her name was Mitsue Endo. She went through the usual screening by the FBI, as we all did. More importantly, she had a brother fighting in the all-Japanese-American 442nd Regiment of Combat Team. I don't know if you folks have heard of it, but it was composed of uh, 4,000 Japanese-Americans. They earned more awards for valor than any other unit of its size in military history. <laughs> that included 21 Congressional Medal of Honor, but Congress refused them. Then if you remember when uh, President Clinton was at the White House, he made up for everything. He invited all the recipients, and if they had already gone, their relatives to the White House and gave him the Medal of Honor. You know, Winston Churchill, paraphrasing, always said, you know, Americans always do the right thing after they've exhausted all the other alternatives. <laughs> so no matter what, they come around and do things pretty well. Well, the, uh, the uh, court hearing was interesting in that um, they agreed that the uh, evacuation was uh, what they call military expediency. And that was a great word to use for excuse anything. Military expediency made it necessary for us to be in camps. Um, prior to going to the camp, they put on the eight o'clock curfew on us, um, limited our movement to five miles radius from home, and um, um, took away the bank account of any alien and uh, liquor license of any alien. And my dad ran a restaurant, and you can't run a restaurant without a, license, uh, a liquor license. So um, uh, we just sat there, and uh, in due time, the um, uh, imprisonment occurred. 
It wasn't the war that precipitated the evacuation. The discrimination prejudice against the Oriental, of course, goes way back to day one. I still remember just a week or two in uh, President Obama's departure and his exact words were the Irish deposed the Italians came to this country and made it the greatest country in the world. But what he didn't say was, yeah, but that's because they can get citizenship and vote, and then they had control of the destiny, not only of their own, but in time with enough power, destiny of others. The Japanese, by the night, uh, there was a, uh, 1824 Exclusion Act where Orientals were excluded from citizenship. And without that power, they were completely powerless. The, um, in the camp, um, we, uh, finished the uh, camp and then try to go home after that uh, because my family, my brother was in St. Louis, my sister in Chicago, Madison. We had our parents come to Chicago and um, to cure them. Uh, the majority went back to California, and that was an end of prejudice, of course. They ran into a, a lot of uh, uh, people beating them up, burning up their houses, and so on. But um, it was a culmination, again, of simply the prejudice and discrimination of Oriental by the Caucasians from day one. The, um, in uh, 18, rather, uh, in 1983, President Carter created a commission to examine the validity of this internment and their conclusion was the internment was condemned as unjust, motivated by racism, and not military security. In 1988, President Reagan signed legislation for a redress of $20,000 tax-free. So I used to go around telling my white friends, for another $20,000 tax-free, you can kick me any time. <laughs> No one ever took me up on that. <laughs> and then in 1020, President Bush sent each of us a letter of apology. And um, there was one incident here which is, I think, quite important. And this is uh, very recent. This is from the Chicago Tribune, dated uh, May 26, 2011. And he says that the Attorney General for the United States had uh, received word that uh, the FBI and the U.S. Naval Intelligence didn't fear any sabotaged by the Japanese uh, in the United States, that there was no concern of them. But this message wasn't given on to the president. And um, it was disclosed later on that um, the attorney general was twice reminded to tell the president that the U uh, U.S. Uh, in, in naval intelligence and the FBI did not feel there was a threat. And 
it was all this was uh, revealed only uh, by the Attorney General at that time of in May 21. The uh, in conclusion, I would say that this is still the greatest country in the world, and uh, I have no regrets. If you have any questions, I'd like to take them. What was the process of getting out of the camp? Pardon? What was the procedure to get out of the camp then? Did you just walk out? No, um, you had to uh, write a, um, a form, and uh, the form consists of 30 questions. And the usual top of name, uh, place of birth, yak, yak, yak. But question 27 and question 28 uh, was a real concern. The question 27 simply asked, we you serve in the military, no problem. Question 28 says, do you forswear any allegiance to the Emperor of Japan? And many of the thoughtful Japanese Americans said, no, because we never swore allegiance to the Emperor of Japan. If you had never sworn allegiance, how can you forswear allegiance? So they put down no, no, and we called them the no, no boys. And um, it wasn't fair, but they were sent to present base on that. When my time came, I said, Yes, yes, yes. Give me any old form, and it's yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Man, I'm out, I'm out of here. I'm a former school teacher, and um, I always have two questions. But first of all, you never talked about your military experience. My next two questions are: What's the best thing that ever happened to you, and what is the worst thing that ever happened to you? The the military um, at the start of the war. President Roosevelt made all of us enemy aliens. So uh, that classification is 4C, enemy alien. Then as the war went on, there was a need for interpreters in the Pacific area of combat. And uh, the natural reservoir of Japanese-speaking uh, Americans would be us. So um, we actually have recruiting teams come to a prison camp and try to recruit us. <laughs> so we ask them if we join the army, right out of this here prison camp, will our parents be able to come out? And they said, no. OK. And then we said, uh -huh. Can we join anything, you know, Navy, Army? And the answer was no. They didn't realize, but that was a backward favor because the only Army unit we can join was what turned out to be the 442nd Regiment of Combat Team made up of nothing but Japanese Americans. And they won more awards for valor than any military unit of its size. So, um, uh, uh, lost my train of thought. Oh, the worst thing, you know, I was 17 years old when this happened. And uh, as a typical 17 year old, what do you worry about? Nothing. What do you care about? Nothing. <laughs> so, I, wherever my parents went, good enough for me. That was home. And um, um, was that the worst one or the good one? <laughs> uh, good thing out of it, uh, I, I can't think of, well, I suppose the good thing was that it took us out of the West Coast, and um, at least 
speaking for myself, and come into a community where you're a minority to be sure, but Wisconsinites, the best people in the world. That's a good part. What was your job in the military? What was your job in the military? Pardon? What was your job? Oh, oh, oh. Um, during the war, I was uh, 4F. Without my glasses, I couldn't even see the E sign. So I was 4F. <laughs> and then um, after the war, uh, they lit up on the physical requirements. So um, the GI Bill of Rights was coming to an end in 46. So I volunteered because I wanted to get the advantage of the GI Bill of Rights. <laughs> now, having spoken Japanese, I would make a good interpreter. Or having had pre-med medicine, and I used to work at the hospital laboratory, I would have made a medic. And a wisdom of the army, they made me a company clerk. <laughs> <laughs> and good thing, because I live in this small town of Brawley in the desert of Southern Cal. 1939, I was a freshman, and every freshman had to take typing. And so prophetic and by accident foresighted because that's exactly the keyboard of a computer. So that's a good thing that occurred to me. Said they took your citizenship away. At what point in your life did they give this back? Oh, uh, yeah. So they uh, need interpreters. They sent a recruitment team to the camp and we just laughed them out of there. So uh, Roosevelt said, no problem. You have gotten your citizen hit back, you're 1A. <laughs> so and your you, parents and everything gave their citizenship at the same time as you back? Or? No. My parents could not get their citizenship until 1952. Although they had come over here in 1905. Wow. How did you get the You know, this is where my eternally grateful for my parents, despite that small pay they got, I'm sure by just denying themselves completely, they always were able to get enough money to pay tuition for the three of us. Did your father lose the restaurant then? Oh, sure. Yeah. It was a fire sale. They knew when we had to leave. We had it the last day. It was a take to leave at proposition, and that was it. And um, our losses were rather minimal because the restaurant wasn't all that big a deal. But there were some very wealthy Japanese businessmen that lost everything. I think we have a question back here. Actually, too, one would be, while you were interned, would you have said that America was the greatest country in the world? And another question is, from your perspective, did America learn its lesson enough to not do something like this again? Or do you think it's a mistake we're capable of repeating? Yeah, will you recite it for me again? Um, the first question was, while you were interned, would you have said that America was the best country in the world? Yeah. And then the second is, um, do you think America's learned its lesson enough that it wouldn't make this kind of mistake again? Yeah. Or do you think it's a mistake we're capable of repeating? Yeah, the first question, uh, I never lost my uh, belief in this being the greatest country in the world. Imagine how the Germans might have treated us, or even the Japanese. And uh, so despite imprisonment, still the greatest country in the world. And uh, could this happen again? Oh, sure. I think that we humans always have 
a sense of cruelty against someone else, and it certainly can happen any time. There's nothing in the laws that will expressly forbid it. It just depends upon us looking after each other. When you came, when your folks came and you were born, did they teach you the language? That, that, that was, we spoke Japanese at home, of course, so that was my initial language. I learned English in school. And um, uh, my mother believed in ed education beyond the grammar school. So after the usual uh, public school, she made us go to a Japanese language school for two hours every day, and that's where I learned to speak the language. Dr. Nino, I know you're a longtime member of First Congregational Church, and I enjoy uh, the opportunity to be your pastor. Thank you, Tanya. I'm wondering um, how your faith has developed over time and what role that might have played in your life. When we were in prison, there was no public outcry. And perhaps the most outstanding and not crying out were the churches. The only group that tried to help us was ACLU, American Civil Liberty Union. So um, well, I will let the rest of that, because it wasn't the working of God, it was working of the U.S. government. <laughs> Can't blame it on them. Any other questions? I wonder how many people here have had you in some form as a free person. <laughs> 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 Again, the nicest people in the world. <laughs> we should take that photo. Yeah. Um, so if you had Dr. Nino uh, in some form as a pediatrician, Dr. Nino, would you stand right there? <laughs> in front of your children? <laughs> Just right there. That's perfect. Okay, would you raise your hand again? That's pretty amazing. <laughs> okay, any other questions? My daughter is marrying an immigrant, and their wedding will be a fusion of American and Indian culture. Was your wedding to your wife, did it incorporate any Japanese traditions in your ceremony? And then past that, in your house, in your household, how did you incorporate Japanese traditions as you raised a family? About the only thing Japanese about our family is we have rice and green tea somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> And then uh, regarding uh, raising our children, uh, that was the one place where we disagreed. Uh, I'm very Japanese, he uh, was very strict. <laughs> and uh, and bless my heart for my wife because she is so kind and sweet and understanding. I think my kids would all jump off the cliff without her. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah.
asking the question that, you know, at the time that your parents uh, came over from Japan to the United States, was there any family that remained in Japan, and were they there during the war? There were. Were they there during the war? The any of your family remained in Japan during the time of the Second World War? Any of your parents' family members? Oh, yeah. In fact, other than an uncle in L.A., all my relatives live in Japan. Did they all survive through the war? Yeah, yeah, the majority made it. They even live, our relatives live today. And, and, and uh, as an interpreter, I was assigned to MacArthur, so I had a chance to visit all my relatives. I was wondering how you chose pediatrics. Oh, um, when you go through medical school, at least in my days, uh, the first two years, you're studying simple uh, physical, chemistry, science. Then in the second, a third year, you start to see kids. And from the first instant, I had a natural liking of children. I felt very comfortable with them. And, um, and therefore, I chose pediatrics. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for your attendance. I appreciate it greatly.